Sayyidati Anisati Sadati, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences. I would like to welcome and Dr. Adnan Shihabuddin, our Director General, who will give short opening remarks and introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Adnan. Good evening, bonsoir, everybody. I'm especially delighted tonight I'm going to speak in English because my French is terrible. Je comprends, maybe. But I'm really delighted uh, to welcome you all to KFS Links uh, this evening. Uh, it's a speaker series aiming to promote the dissemination of science, technology, and innovation, information about science and technology and innovation, STI as it's well known, and to provide for a platform for knowledge exchange that will advance, hopefully, capacity for building human capital and as well as to establish potential for collaboration and activities that is in line with what KFAS mandate is all about. Tonight is not about KFAS. Tonight is about the speaker series and what we are about to hear. The title of today's lecture is the future of higher education in the 21st century, global mindset, student mobility, and the importance of social sciences. And it is to be given by a distinguished guest and friend, Mr. Uh, Dr. Frédéric Mion, the president of Science Po University in Paris, France. Welcome to KFAS. And I am delighted to welcome so many distinguished personalities from Science Po. My good friend Enrico Letta. For a few who don't know Enrico, Enrico was a prime minister of Italy, but he's also academic at heart. Welcome to Kuwait. Welcome, Vanessa. And I must recognize Her Excellency, the Ambassador of the Republic of France, who is with us tonight, and Sheikh Hassa. She is delighted to always welcome you to KFAS, and I'm uh, so happy to see you with us tonight. President of Kuwait University, and I just saw walking our very good friend, Ambassador Sharikh, who will be hosting Enrico for another lecture tomorrow at the Diplomatic Academy, Dr. Walid. But really what I wanted to say is why we have an agreement and why we are hosting Frederic tonight because Science Po is one of KFAS' most important international partners, and I really mean it. Many of you may not have heard much about Science Po before, but I'm sure after tonight you will know much more about it. And we are proud that with Science Po we've had a relationship of over 12 years and running very strong relationship. We had a meeting of the advisory committee. And I think I haven't seen any advisory committee so smooth because the work was done efficiently. But the Kuwait program at Science Po, I'm going to run through this very quickly because I'm, I, I know that you're anxious to listen to the distinguished speaker. But the program, Kuwait program at Science Po of KFAS, aims to develop joint initiatives between Kuwaiti academics and researchers and their counterparts at the elite university in the French system, Science Po covering a wide array of major fields of interest. I'm not going to enumerate them. And if you know what Science Po University is, you know who is the president of France next time. Right? Because almost all of the presidents of France came through Science Po. At least that's what I understand. And I, I couldn't resist the observation that if it was two years ago and I was introducing you, I would have said that your age, a very young age, like the president, which is the mirror image of my age, you would have been 47 and I would have been 74. <laughs> so please allow me just to give you a very brief introduction about our speaker. I mentioned his age. It's very unusual to be a president of a university, that elite university at this very young age. But I think in France these days, it's not unusual to be a president of any institution at a young age, including the president of the republic. 
uh, President Mayor Federic, as I call him, took up his current post as the President of Science Po in April 2013. And he is uh, honored so many titles, so I'm not going to run through these. But he is recognized in France, and he has received so many awards in France and abroad. He was educated at Science Po, but he is also educated at the Princeton University, the École Nationale d'Administration and École Normale Supérieure. Dr. Mayon taught public law at Science Po and headed the University Department of Public Administration in the 90s, and he served as a technical advisor to the Minister of Education, Jack Lang, and I'm sure many of you who are involved in education, in academic, you know about Jack Lang. That was between 2000 and 2001, and I could cover so many things about what uh, President Mayon did in administration, in law firms. He practiced law also in the French system. In 2007, he was attend appointed as a general counsel at Canal Plus, Canal Plus, yeah? and I'm sure all of you, you know that, until 2013. Since he taken his post as a president, of the Science Po, he has led a number of major initiatives at Science Po, and now Science Po is number three in the world, in its field. So, many of you can heard of Harvard, heard of Princeton, but those of you who are in political science, in administration, in government, know that Science Po is number three in the world, ranked number three in the world. But President Mayo was not satisfied. So he initiated a number of reforms at university governance and statutes, renovation of the regional campuses, completion of restructuring of graduate studies in the school, continuation of internationalization, and the development of a scientific strategy, acquisition of science for new urban campus in the heart of Paris, which I saw plans this evening, uh, this morning. Now the strategy set out of Science Po, set out in Science Po 2022, aims to further Science Po development as a leading international university while preserving all that has underpinned its identity and success since it was founded in the year of 1872. So that makes it over uh, almost 200 years and plus, uh, 150 years. The exceptional social, academic, and geographical diversity of its student body, the combination of an advanced academic curriculum and practical courses delivered by thousands of professionals from all fields, makes this is an excellent setting for education and research. And it has a very strong component. And for those of you students and young people who are thinking about going there, they teach in English at the graduate level and even at the undergraduate level. So you don't have to worry about mastering French language when you are in Paris, but I advise you strongly do master French. You will enjoy so many things about France if you know the language. Without further ado, I am pleased to invite our distinguished guest to the podium, President Frédéric Mayon. Dear Shira Hassa, Madame l'Ambassadrice, dear Dr. Adnan, dear board members of the Q White Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences, dear presidents of uh, universities present here tonight, Monsieur le Doyen, cher Henri Coletta, Madame la Directrice, cher Vanessa Scherer, dear colleagues, dear students, I see a few students, uh, possibly even high school students in your midst, and dear friends, it is a true pleasure, as well as an honor, to be here tonight um, with you and to be offered this uh, wonderful opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. I would like first and foremost to thank my friend Dr. Adnan very warmly for his kind words of introduction. Um, you forgot to say one important thing, Adnan, uh, about uh, Sciences Po this evening, and that is that our ambassadress here 
is, of course, Sciences Po alumna, as tend to be most ambassadors around the world. And so we're very happy to have one of our alumni. This is a piece, a piece of information that was, that was lacking in, in the file that Annan had with him. But you, uh, you, you were very, very kind in your, in your words of introduction. And, um, and uh, it is, as I said, for me, uh, a true privilege to be, to be here tonight. I feel that this lecture and the conversation which will follow are probably the best way for us to mark the strength of the long-standing partnership which has been binding my university, Sciences Po, with the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences and uh, through the foundation with the Emirate of Kuwait and the region. And perhaps more importantly, this lecture is a way for me to express my deep and my heartfelt gratitude for this wonderful relationship which has been evolving over the past 15 years and which has been, I think, instrumental for our university's international strategy. This is, I have to confess, my first trip to this land, to this country of Kuwait. And as I marvel at the extremely warm welcome which I have received, I can't help but wonder what has taken me so long to come and visit. And I'm sure that after this very short two-day visit, um, I'll be looking for more opportunities to come and spend time here. Before I go on to the topic of our conversation, um, I would like to take a moment to thank, again, most particularly, Dr. Adnan Shihabeldin, the Director General of KFAS, for his vision, for his leadership, and for the trust and friendship which he has consistently demonstrated towards Sciences Po in the last decade and a half. And together with Adnan, I would like to thank his wonderful team, led by our friend Dr. Amani Albeda, uh, Deputy Director of KFAS, as well as the KFAS board members, many of whom I've been fortunate enough to get to know over the years when they come to Paris for the meetings of the uh, advisory board that uh, Adnan referred to in his uh, remarks, and whom it is such a pleasure to see uh, for the first time on their home turf. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your unfailing dedication to a partnership which we at Sciences Po value so very greatly. I am gratified to note that the Kuwait program at Sciences Po has grown significantly over the years. It has grown into an important, into a multifaceted operation, supporting students, supporting professors, supporting research, supporting academic events. This partnership between KFAS and Sciences Po serves as a glittering example of the type of international collaboration which strives to enhance a common focus on excellence in education, in research, in policy, and which can promote a true dialogue between our regions of the world. So, in a sense, the topic for tonight's conversation was a very simple one to choose because it derives very directly from the sort of relationship which we've built with KFAS over the years. And this evening, as Adnan reminded us, our conversation will focus on the future of education in the 21st century. Of course, a great many things could be said about the future of education, but I decided to focus on three points which seem to me to be essential in understanding what education will be about in the century to come, and which, of course, will be nourished by the experience which we have gained at Sciences Po over the last 150 years, in, and especially in the last 20 years of that rich history. First, I will try and describe what it is that we uh, have in mind when we talk about a global mindset for universities. Secondly, I will address the issue of student and staff mobility and try and assess the impact of that mobility upon our institutions and upon the world. And thirdly, I will try and convince you, and I know that is no easy task, that the social sciences are essential in shaping the sorts of leaders that our world will need tomorrow. Three points, and I'll try and keep this brief enough that we can have an actual conversation afterwards. Please allow me a short introduction on, on Sciences Po. As, remind, as, as Adnan reminded us, Sciences Po was founded in 1872, that is to say close to 150 years ago. And ever since the very beginning, 
Sciences Po has striven to internationalize the content of its teaching, to encourage the learning of foreign languages, and to place a strong focus on the study of international affairs as well as current politics. This is very much Sciences Po's history. I, I, would, I should even say that this is very much Sciences Po's DNA, this relationship with the outside world at a time back in the last decades of the 19th century when this was not necessarily the case for the big university uh, institutions that the world uh, then counted. So from its very foundation until today, Sciences Po has thought of itself as having uh, the duty to be open internationally, to be open to the world. It is all the more interesting because our university was in fact founded in a context of a very dramatic domestic crisis. Sciences Po was created in the direct aftermath of a severe, of a, a humiliating defeat suffered by France at the hands of Prussia. And the founder of Sciences Po, Emile Boutmy, who was very much a patriot, was convinced that the reason why France had lost the war was that the elites who were then in charge of the country had been poorly trained to do their jobs. And hence, they had declared war when they were in fact unprepared to fight a war. They had in fact very poorly fought the war and then they had negotiated a very poor peace treaty. So Boutmy felt that a new type of institution was needed in order to train new elites for the country. He said famously that what happened in that defeat of France against Russia was really the defeat of the Sorbonne against the University of Berlin, hence his decision to create a new school. And this new school was aimed at helping France regain its station among the big powers of the day. But even though the aim was patriotic, the outlook from the start was extremely international. Boutmy felt that in order for France to regain its status, what was required was a deep understanding of foreign systems and an easy familiarity with all the countries of the world and their cultures. And so he emphasized from the very start the, import, the importance of comparative studies, the necessity to admit foreign students in his fledgling new school, as well as the need for exchanging students and faculty with foreign universities of high repute. So much so that the first exchange of students between Sciences Po and a foreign university happened in the early 1880s with Cornell University in the US, which I'm sure many of you here know. And we started receiving foreign students early on in our history. The first Chinese students came to Sciences Po in the year 1886, and then two of them went on to create to found the great university of Fudan in Shanghai. So from the very start, Sciences Po thought of itself as a university at the heart of a, a, at the nexus of a network of other institutions uh, like-minded around the world. And of course, this movement gained power in the aftermath of World War II and even more in the past two decades as we all witnessed the advent of glo globalization in the world of higher education and research. Sciences Po is now home to 14,000 students, of whom roughly half hold a foreign passport, that is to say a non-French passport. Half our student population originating from abroad, that is a figure and a proportion which is rarely met in Europe and, and I think hardly at all in, on the European continent. In the UK, you would probably find institutions with uh, equally as high a proportion and some with a, a slightly higher one. So 50% of our student population originate from a foreign country. There are some 150 different nationalities present at Sciences Po. We're almost as diverse as the, as the UN. And a majority of the courses taught at Sciences Po, as Adnan reminded us, are in fact taught in English, which was the condition, the prerequisite, if we wanted to be able to attract the best students from all over the world, of course, we could not make it mandatory for them to master the French language uh, in order to join us. This, of course, translates into the research produced at Sciences Po. And as uh, Dr. Adnan kindly reminded us, that explains why Sciences Po is now 
ranked third in the world for political science and um, international relations, third in the world just behind Harvard and Oxford, uh, but before all the other ones, before Princeton, before Yale, before Berkeley, you, you can name them all. Uh, we, we do not, in fact, place a, a great stock in, in rankings at Sciences Po, except when they're favorable to us. So I'm, I'm just mentioning this one tonight because it is a, a, a very pleasant figure, that third position. And so rankings are one thing, uh, but as I was saying, our research is strongly international. We uh, take pride in hosting France's largest and most renowned research center on the question of international relations and, uh, um, and uh, cultural studies. It's called the CERI, uh, and it is home to over 50 top professors and um, one, some 100 PhD candidates. But all of our research programs are international in their outlook, and uh, the international contingent in our faculty has been also soaring uh, in, in the past 10 years. So that while Sciences Po is certainly very proud of its heritage and of its role as a key player in the training of French elites, we now see ourselves primarily as an international university of global influence based in France. Why is this international dimension so important? And how does it relate to the topic of uh, our discussion today? In a world where interconnectedness is, as we know, a fact of life. We all live by our social networks. In a world where no single issue affecting our lives is confined to national borders. In a world where ideas and people circulate faster than, the, than they've ever done in human history. We feel that elite institutions have no choice but to embrace a global mindset, to think of themselves as one element in a global system. And that is the reason why, as uh, professors Philip Altbach and Jane Knight, respectively from Boston College and uh, uh, the University of Toronto, said, uh, showed in a recent article that international activities in top universities have expanded and evolved dramatically over the past three decades, resulting in integration in uh, international research, resulting in soaring student mobility, resulting as well in the extensive use of information technology and e-learning to provide a wider global educational reach. Embracing a global mindset means trying to be aware of what's happening outside of our country, being focused on uh, what happens internationally. But it also means that universities have to endorse and to affirm more fully their own role, their own institutional role as global, global players in their own right. That is to say, as institutions which can produce an impact on issues that are of global significance. As such, um, uh, that, 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 it, that is the reason why Sciences Po led an effort a few months ago in the uh, process leading up to the meeting of the G7 countries in France, in Biarritz, uh, at the end of August. We led an effort to create a coalition of top universities from the G7 countries, as well as some other countries in the rest of the world, with an aim to come to together to a list of commitments by which each one of our universities represented by its president will determinedly try to work on some of the main issues which are uh, on the global agenda at present, whether it be uh, inequalities uh, of access to education and other services, whether it be global warming and all the resulting uh, damages, but the, the list is actually quite long. We called this alliance the U7 plus alliance, seven because of G7 plus because we do not limit ourselves to G7 countries. And we have drawn up a list of uh, six principles, 250 individual commitments made by each one of the presidents, the 50 presidents who were present for that initial meeting. And I believe that it is the very first time 
that uh, an alliance of universities is created with the aim of structuring and advancing the role of academic institutions, not just as places where learning and, and research are produced, but also as actors of the multilateral agenda in their own right. And so the U7 Alliance, the U7 Plus Alliance is, I think, a good example of how uh, institutional diversity and dialogue can be translated into action. Diversity. Diversity is a key element of the global mindset that I was uh, trying to, to describe. Diversity spanning from students to faculty and staff is precisely what safeguards the type of environment that is necessary to succeed in today's world of higher education and, more importantly, in today's world period. But the diversity which we strive for cannot be, strictly, cannot be simply and only geographic. In other words, a global mindset is not just one which encompasses all five continents, continents and all the furthest, furthest reaches of the earth. Equally as important to a global mindset is the need to embrace intellectual and, most importantly, social diversity, with students coming to our institutions from a wide range of family and economic backgrounds. By sharing classes and working on joint pro projects with students from backgrounds very dissimilar from their own, they are encouraged to confront their approaches and their outlooks, and so to produce what we hope will be truly innovative solutions uh, and responses for the world. Thus, uh, I think that um, adopting a global mindset goes hand in hand with uh, trying to nurture a diverse community, one which integrates, as I said, different social backgrounds, one also which strives to maintain gender balance, and this, of course, we know is a, a, a major issue, one which represents nationalities and cultures from all four corners of the globe. But all three elements are equally as important, social diversity, gender balance, cultural and geographic diversity. This is the type of classroom environment that makes it possible to achieve excellence in teaching and training because students will not just learn from their professors, but they will in fact learn one from another in equal proportion to what makes one student different from another. I think this is a very important point. This is in fact a point that was made many, many years before I make it tonight with you. Um, it reminds me of, of some of the things that John Henry Newman wrote uh, in the uh, uh, second half of the 19th century. Newman was, as I'm sure many of you know, a, a great educator, a philosopher who thought uh, uh, of education. And he famously made the, 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 this point, which I, I find still very thought-provoking today. He said, if I were given the choice between two different types of universities, on the one hand, a university with the best professors in the world who would just come into the classroom and impart their knowledge to passive students taking notes and then taking exams at the end of the semester. And on the other hand, with a university that would dispense with professors altogether, that would dispense with exams and simply make it possible for students coming from all around the world to spend two, three or four years together and to teach one another, I would, Newman said, without hesitation, choose the second type of university. And I think there's, there's truth in this statement. And that truth is that diversity is exactly what makes excellence possible. Diversity is not detrimental to excellence. It is, in fact, what makes excellence possible. And that is why our institutions have to, to strive to achieve that diversity. And Sciences Po has, in fact, uh, led a pioneering uh, role in France and in Europe in implementing affirmative action schemes designed to ensure that diversity would, in fact, be affected at Sciences Po. In the face of a lot of opposition, uh, some 20 years ago, we launched the very first schemes that 
enabled us to admit into Sciences Po students from less favored areas um, who would not normally have been admitted by going through the uh, habitual selection processes. And this has done wonders in changing our institution for the better, and I think in helping it achieve a much, uh, a much better international status. And of course, as I said, uh, for the same reason, we also have to work towards gender diversity in all fields, in all disciplines. We know that there is a great imbalance in all universities between the disciplines, that there are a lot more men in the STEM disciplines than women, and a lot more women in the social sciences than in STEM. And of course, this imbalance is a problem in both cases. Enhancing the opportunities for intellectual, gender, and international diversity, uh, that, that is what we need to do, and, and gender balance is uh, absolutely, absolutely essential. I realize that uh, uh, the time is moving, and I, I should as well move to my second point and, and focus now uh, for a little bit on the question of mobility, student mobility and faculty mobility. Never in history have students benefited from uh, as many opportunities as they do now to explore all reaches of the globe. And Sciences Po decided 20 years ago to make it mandatory for all undergraduates in their third and final year of study to go and spend a whole year abroad, usually with a, a partner university. And we have the great good fortune of have, having such a, a partnership with Kuwait University, uh, an exchange of students, uh, because we have had to build a network of some 480 partner universities around the world to be able to host the 1,500 students whom we send for a whole year abroad. And of course, conversely, we receive at Sciences Po exchange students from all 480 universities, and they come to us for one semester and sometimes two. For those students, the benefits that come from immersing themselves in a new academic environment, the benefits that come from learning a new language for some of them, the benefits that come from expanding their sense of cultural understanding and so of developing as an individual uh, to succeed in today's increasingly multicultural and international world, those benefits are incredibly, incredibly high, incredibly important. And they all realize, even before they leave on that third year, that there lies for them a tremendous opportunity. In fact, many of the students, many of the top students admitted at Sciences Po as undergraduates come to us because they know that that third year is part of the program. And as bright students interested in the world, they feel that that third year would be a key element in the process of making them uh, become re, um, uh, citizens, you know, fully citizens and, and, and adults. So they go for a whole year to uh, uh, all the continents from Asia to Africa, from North to South America, from uh, the Middle East to Australia and Europe. And the notion at stake there is that of global citizenship, which I think is a key educational concept. It is the idea that we are interconnected, that we are collectively responsible for our future, along with future generations. Climate change, inequalities of economic and social development, migrations, all are issues which are transboundary, that require thinking beyond borders. And global citizenship at the university level encourages students to develop critical competencies such as analytical thinking. Being exposed to an international environment during uh, the years when they develop in, into adults takes students out of their natural, their everyday environment and forces them to adjust to new and unfamiliar situations. And so it nurtures in a, a very important way their critical thinking skills in an accelerated fashion. These fundamental skills will also enable students to learn, to brainstorm, and so one hopes to solve major issues of our time uh, when the moment for them comes to face th those challenges. I'm sure that many of you in this audience have 
are familiar with the, the work um, of uh, the British writer David Goodhart. In fact, I've heard Dean Letta quoted time and again, so I'm happy to do it in his stead tonight. Um, in his book, The Road to Somewhere, David Goodhart distinguishes between two types of, of people, the ones he calls the anywheres and the ones he calls the somewheres. And essentially, the anywheres are those people educated in the best schools, well-traveled, who could function and, uh, and adapt in any kind of situation. And he compares them or distinguishes them from the somewheres, that is to say, people who, usually for social and economic reasons, have had to stay in one place and haven't had the opportunity to get to know the world as the first category of population has. And he elaborates upon this distinction to explain why a large proportion of the population in the developed world is now so mistrustful of its ruling classes because he says that a big disconnect has happened between the anywheres and the somewheres. In fact, I firmly believe that we can be both open to the world, multilingual and mobile, and as such, anywhere, whilst still having an identity and a strong attachment to our own somewhere. And in order to strengthen the ability of our students to engage with the world at a very local, and not just at the global level, we have also developed a series of initiatives, some compulsory and some not, which foster their civic engagement within their local communities and which help fight the feeling of disconnection which I just described and with which so many of their fellow countrymen reproach them. As such, all undergraduates at Sciences Po must engage in a community engagement program which lasts three years and which is mentored by faculty members. That scheme will make them work directly in contact with less favored populations, whether it be uh, school children in need of special help or the elderly, the sick, uh, refugees, you name it. They will have to work directly in contact with these populations and so to gain direct experience of the difficulties encountered by very real people in very concrete situations, sometimes just uh, miles away from uh, the bubble that so many universities tend, tend to be. But reaching out to address practical day-to-day -day issues is also made possible through other initiatives which are not mandatory but which have proven to be very effective, such as our uh, School of Public Affairs Policy Lab, which combines research and action to prepare our students to think about public policy in new ways and to develop concrete solutions for new practical challenges. So students are able to put these ideas into action through case studies, simulations, a public policy incubator, and, and with dialogues with, with all the key stakeholders on the ground. Bridging theory and practice is, I think, key to our discussion today about the future of higher education. So all this goes to show that, as, as I was saying before, there is no inherent contradiction between diversity and rootedness. The two can and do coexist if only we take the trouble to make them coexist. Living in close quarters with diversity and thriving on it, learning from it, does not lead one to resemble others and to erase one's own specificities. It can, on the contrary, be a means in which to express our, unique, our uniqueness and our identity and to express also our connection with the communities from which we originate. Now, going back to international strategy and the question of mobility, study abroad is, of course, not the only way in which universities promote international dialogue and its inherent added value. Uh, globally engaged universities like Sciences Po undertake to expand and to create even deeper connections with strategic partner universities worldwide, especially through the development of pioneering dual degrees, faculty mobility through very strong alliances. International dual degree uh, partnerships, for instance, by which a university like us agrees to share the sovereign capacity to deliver that degree, those require an enormous amount of trust, 
of shared com confidence, of collaboration on the part of the two partner institutions in order to ensure their success. And they have proven to be formidable tools of international cooperation at the highest level, providing students with a truly international foundation and scope and driving excellence for an institution such as us. I would like to add one last word on student mobility with a quick focus on an issue which is often debated, but on which I personally have, at this stage, fairly mixed convictions. And that is the issue of uh, online education. We have all witnessed the establishment of massive open online courses, those famous MOOCs, which have started uh, coming to, uh, to, to the foreground possibly about seven or eight years ago and which have the ability of allowing for unlimited student outreach with only the benefit of a, an internet connection and a computer. Under the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, goal number four aims to, I quote, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. And obviously, MOOCs serve exactly this purpose, improving access to higher education and expanding outreach of education beyond the four walls of the traditional university structure. I do not view MOOCs as a substitute to student mobility, and I do not view MOOCs as a response to the need for more education around the world. I view them more as one element in a chain of proposals that can be made to develop higher education, I see them as, as uh, an important element, but not, not as the sole response. They ultimately will be, I think, just one brick in the building we need to build together, which will be that of uh, national and cross-continental integrated curricula and courses, which may be the future of uh, uh, global and civic edu education in the years to come. So MOOCs are a part of the answer, but they're not the answer to the question of uh, a wider opening of our university systems. I've focused uh, a lot on student mobility. Maybe I should say a word on faculty mobility, which of course is equally as important as that of, of student mobility. Um, one of the key initiatives, in fact, which we've been able to uh, develop with the benefit of the uh, program which we have with the uh, Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences, is to provide faculty around the globe, experts on the Middle East, uh, with the opportunity to come and teach at Sciences Po within our renowned School of International Affairs, whose Dean Henri Coletta is with us tonight. Since the beginning of our long, long standing relationship with KFAS, we have been able to welcome nine visiting professors. Uh, we will have two visiting professors in the next semester, the spring semester of the year 2020 including uh, Dr. Nayef al shamari from Kuwait University, who just received a very prestigious prize and we're, whom we're delighted and, and very proud to, to welcome uh, in our fold in uh, the, the months to come. Professor mobility of the kind made possible through this program ensures that students learn about social sciences from different perspectives, from different cultures, from different backgrounds, and it is a very powerful means of integrating diversity directly within our teaching curriculum. And now, in the interest of, I, I can't say brevity anymore, I've been far too long, I, I will move on to my third and final and mercifully shorter point in which I will try and explain why social sciences uh, are critical to me in shaping the leaders of today and tomorrow. The so-called exact or hard sciences produce scientific evidence, they produce technological innovation, which push the world forward, but they are likely to fail to shape our future for the better if they are disconnected from those other sciences, which are now commonly dubbed as social, the social sciences, which aim to make sense of the world in all its complexities and to analyze the ways in which change can be, can be brought about effectively within human societies. Social sciences and the humanities are key subjects which young people need to master in order 
to prepare for an uncertain future. Whatever the challenges our students will face in the future, be they technological transformations, climate change, conflict resolutions, the disintegration of the welfare state, whatever path our graduates uh, will embrace as engineers, as policy makers, as uh, uh, the leaders of NGOs, as business leaders, scientists or journalists, their greatest asset will be their ability to think critically and to think ethically. Technical knowledge is essential, but technical knowledge is perishable. It proves only too soon to be outdated. And our aim is to equip our students with those analytical skills and human qualities which we think will enable them 15, 20, 30 years hence to face challenges of which we simply have no idea. We need to prepare them for the unforeseeable because the one thing we know for sure is that the unforeseeable will happen time and again as it has happened time and again in our own lifetimes. Professor David Berliner famously and controversially stated that, I quote, easy to do science is what those in physics, chemistry, geology, and some other fields do. Hard to do science is what the social scientists do. We face particular problems and must deal with local conditions that limit generalizations and theory building, problems that are different from those faced by the easier to do sciences." End of quote. His statement, of course, was meant to provoke, but there is, I think, truth, a little grain of truth to his idea. So, so social sciences are often written off as soft sciences, as easy subjects to comprehend, but they are in fact challenging. They are demanding and they are necessary. And it is only through collaboration between the hard and the soft sciences that results will be achieved in curing the ever-increasing woes of our planet. We at Sciences Po took it upon ourselves recently to try and promote the importance of social sciences in the world of today by bringing together a consortium of universities which, just like ours, have decided to focus in that field primarily. And we have gained for that university the stamp of approval, the label of the European Commission. And we have, we have created the first European university dedicated to the social sciences. It's called Civica. And it groups us together with some seven institutions across the continent, among which universities uh, that I'm sure you know well here, uh, the London School of Economics and Political Science, Bocconi University in Milan, the Stockholm School of Economics, uh, and a few others. And together, we aim to create a Europe-wide space of free circulation and a transnational work environment for students and scholars specializing in the social sciences, promoting European civic values, and designing answers to the ma major questions facing our planet, including the crises of democracy, the environmental challenges, which I've mentioned a few times tonight, and the impact of technology on societies. For Sciences Po, Civica creates a true European uh, campus that marks yet another milestone in a path uh, of development that has been for the past 20 years and will remain uh, for decades to come resolutely international. So the trust we place in international cooperation to foster our own development, as you see, is very, very important. And it is, in fact, one of the central values which we share with KFAS and which I have the privilege of celebrating with all of you tonight. And this brings me to my conclusion. But before I leave off and open uh, the, the floor to uh, discussion, I would like to add one final word, which is not directly connected to what I said previously, but I would just like to express a thought of solidarity and, and a friendship for two of our Sciences Po colleagues who have been detained for the past six months, not too far from here, in Tehran, Iran, 
uh, Madame Fariba Adelcha and Monsieur Roland Marshall, two Sciences Po researchers who are currently in jail in Tehran for no other reason that, uh, than the fact that they are researchers attempting to do their work. They are present in my heart uh, as I speak to you and ever present in the thoughts of our entire Sciences Po community. And um, I feel that it is important for all of us to have a little thought for them this evening. Thank you very much for your attention and the floor is now open for discussion. We have time to take a few questions, especially we have such a audience uh, and I will try to uh, field questions from diverse age groups and diverse uh, origins because I want to follow the lead that was given to me by uh, President Mayo. And by the way, I'm so glad you touched upon online education because it is a, a major question that is currency challenging everybody. What is the role of uh, online education? And I must tell you before I open the floor for discussion that I am a believer in the role, in the critical and important role of social sciences as part, a fundamental part of the education of any citizens in the world. With this, I open the floor for anybody who would like. By the way, uh, if you want to speak, there is a, a microphone at the side arm. You just pull the side arm, pick up the microphone, and press the button. There's a red button. I, w I wish Dr. Rumehi would ask his question before he leaves. <laughs> Thank you very much, because he's a social scientist in Thank Kuwait. You. All right, who wants to start? Please, Professor. First, I'm not a professor. You know, I'm C minus student. I graduated in seven years from, you know, I got my bachelor's degree in seven years, so I'm not too smart. But I'm a good businessman, not a consultant. Um, my question uh, for us, uh, if we would like to have continuous uh, training or continuous study, uh, we are forced to have uh, like the upper, uh, you know, like graduate uh, classes. Uh, we have to leave our jobs for two years, and also we have to get like high degrees in GMAT and other new exams, which we don't know anything about it. As a C minus student, that's why I, when I started, I'd like to have like the leadership program, which is have been uh, applied in uh, Harvard Business School, which has been also sponsored by KFAS. Also, there is uh, the uh, EMBA, which is specified for the people who don't have time to leave their jobs and also do not believe in the online uh, educations. Uh, education is built by communication. Communication, you should communicate with your colleague, your, your schools, you know, your, your professors. You, 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 know, you walk on a campus and, and that's how you feel, how you get study. So I would like to have to have a few questions. You know, my question is if you have such of this uh, uh, program in the university or not. Thank you. Okay, I'll take a couple of more questions and then I will give you the answer. Uh, Professor Zabalawi, President of uh, Amer uh, Australian, Australian College of Kuwait, please. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask about the Alliance G7, how it is related to the University Magna Carta. That was, this was signed by 50 presidents. The other one signed by 800 Rectors, in fact. This is the first part. The second part about the mobility, and you are talking about the future. In fact, the issue of the mobility is not a new one in Europe. It's the Erasmus Plus project. They talk about 20% of the faculty members and the students should be on, on mobile. Again, also the action lines of the Bologna process. They talk about the joint degrees. And in fact, you know, so my question is to which extent that the Bologna process has affected the performance of your institution. Thank you. Okay, one more question, if there is, I could, for the time being, yes, the young lady there and, uh, and the one next to her. So both of you can take part in this question. Hello. Introduce uh, yourself, please. Okay. Hello, I'm a student in uh, the French School of Kuwait, uh, and I have a question, but can I ask... You can question? ask in French. Too. Yeah, can I ask in French, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, basically now, um, avec la nouvelle réforme, on a des spécialités à apprendre. Et si on voudrait uh, rentrer en Sciences Po, quelle spécialité doit-on choisir pour pouvoir y rentrer? 
So I cannot translate it, but <laughs> Professor <laughs> Mayo. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and uh, your colleague. Bonsoir, je m'appelle Joana Osman, je suis une élève du lycée français de Koweït également. Je voulais savoir un peu plus sur la, les sélections pour, uni, pour votre université, juste pour en savoir plus pour le futur. Merci. Ok. Professeur Mayo. Thank you for all these, uh, these excellent questions. Um, maybe I should start with the end and answer in French the, the two questions asked in French. Uh, which relate to the issue of selection uh, to be uh, admitted into Sciences Po and what you need to do to prepare for that. Um, sur la, la question des spécialités pour le baccalauréat, il faut que vous soyez très tranquille. Nous souhaitons des candidats qui représentent la plus grande diversité de spécialités possible. D'ores et déjà aujourd'hui, nous encourageons des candidats qui viennent de la section S ou de la section ES ou de la section L. Et demain, notre souhait, c'est d'ouvrir nos portes à des candidats qui auront choisi les combinaisons de spécialités les plus variées. Donc il n'y a aucune sorte de prérequis disciplinaire pour entrer à Sciences Po. Il faut que vous choisissiez les spécialités pour lesquelles vous éprouvez la plus forte inclination le plus fort intérêt. Pourquoi Parce que ce sont sans doute les spécialités dans lesquelles vous obtiendrez de ce fait les meilleures notes et donc qui vous permettront d'entrer le plus facilement possible à Sciences Po. Ce qui renvoie à l'autre question sur la sélection à l'entrée à Sciences Po. Pour les étudiants internationaux, elle suppose de déposer un dossier de candidature dans lequel vous fournissez vos bulletins scolaires de seconde, de première, de terminale, dans lequel vous allez décrire votre motivation pour entrer à Sciences Po, les raisons pour lesquelles vous souhaitez être admise dans notre institution. Et si votre dossier est jugé suffisamment solide, suffisamment excellent, vous serez invité à passer un entretien d'admission non loin de l'endroit où vous habitez, en tout cas le moins loin possible. Nous essayons de faire des entretiens partout autour de la planète. Euh, si vous... Si vous êtes ici à Koweït, il y aura des, sections de, de sélection, des, des, des sessions de sélection qui seront proposées pas trop loin. Mais en tout cas, je forme tous les voeux de succès pour l'une et l'autre d'entre vous et peut-être les camarades qui sont venus avec vous euh, ce soir. Um, going back uh, in, in, uh, in, to, to, to the other questions, first the issue of continuing education and executive training. This, of course, is an essential part of what a university has to do and has to propose today. And it has, as you rightly said, to take into account the fact that those people coming to us to get leadership training, executive training, are people who um, are facing special requirements and who live in particular conditions that, do not, that often do not make it possible for them to go away from home for one or two years to study full-time and, uh, and take a, a master's degree or the equivalent in that amount of time. So, of course, we do offer executive masters, which require far less time of attendance uh, on the ground at, at school. We do so in a variety of fields. We do not do EMBAs at Sciences Po. We have a school of management. We do not propose uh, EMBAs, executive MBAs. We propose executive masters in a variety of other fields, especially in the field of public affairs, of urban development, uh, public health, communication, the media, the, the list is, is very, very long. Um, and we have a, a great number of, of, of top-notch applicants year after year. And those are organized in such a way that they can actually be taken by people who live far away from Paris. And this is the, this is the type of program for which online education, of course, proves important because just like you, I think that it is important to have in-class experience to make the, the training experience worthwhile, but it's very nicely complemented by modules that can be followed online for those um, executive students who have a job uh, on the side. They can do that at night before they come for the training session the following week or the week after that. Um, and now going back to the two questions uh, asked by the president of the Australian College of Kuwait. First, the Alliance uh, U7 Plus is a little different in its uh, purpose from the Magna Carta, which, as you rightly point out, is a very important uh, um, uh, list of principles which all the universities which signed the Carta agreed upon. We wanted to go one step further by committing to specific 
targets on a set number of issues with uh, an obligation to report every year before the next G7 meeting in the country where it will take place. So there is more of a sense that we as institutions commit to a list of actions for which we make ourselves accountable. Um, the, the number of institutions is smaller because the monitoring system is important and of course would not allow us to grow to uh, the, the figure reached by the Magna Carta and its 800 universities. So there is simply on our part a desire to show that if we decide to do so, we can act at our level, at the level of each and uh, every one of our institutions to make things move in the right direction. Uh, so as I said, the purpose and the spirit are slightly different from those of the Magna Carta. And then uh, as, a, as a connoisseur of, the, of uh, the questions of higher education, you referred to Erasmus+, Plus, the mobility scheme implemented by the European Commission some nearly 30 years ago now, uh, and the Bologna process, both, of course, were very important in encouraging mobility throughout the European higher education system, and therefore very important at Sciences Po. But at Sciences Po, we decided to go several steps beyond the, uh, the, the objectives of the Bologna process and uh, Erasmus by, as I said, making it mandatory for all our students to spend one full year abroad when, of course, the proportions aimed at by, by Bologna and Erasmus were far smaller. But the spirit is very much the same. And in fact, we engaged upon this process just as the Bologna process was being devised and launched, and it helped us greatly achieve the constitution of this net network of 480 universities across the, the globe, of course. That was absolutely essential. President, I'm sorry. First, welcome to Kuwait. Thank you very much for your informative presentation, especially about globalization. We learned a lot about your institution. Uh, my question is about the quality of education your students get when they spend a year outside with such a diverse uh, partner outside. How do you check the quality of what they get during this year? Yes, please. Yes, Salaam alaikum. Uh, my name is Hamid Al-Adwani. I'm the Director General of the National Bureau of uh, Academic Accreditation here in Kuwait. We discussed uh, a lot about you today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, in higher education, especially France, uh, French educa higher educational institutions are not very well represented in international rankings. Mm -hmm. And I know of some efforts taken by the government in terms of commune systems. Mm. Uh, what would be, since we are talking about the future of education, especially when it comes to France, what actions or measures as a whole, as the map of the uh, higher education in France will be taken in order to uh, improve or be more dense in the international rankings? Mm. Thank you. The young lady there. Hi. Two young ladies next to each other. Yeah, we have the same question. Um, thank oh, you. Have the same question? The same question. Okay. Thank you for your speech. My name is Farah al -Atsani. I work in macro research. I'm also an MPA candidate at a university that's partnered with Sciences Po. <laughs> so my question is about how we're currently witnessing, um, not a new, but a definitely loud backlash to globalization through both multilateralism and the threats to multilateralism, as well as through populist parties that we see. Um, and this is the result of people feeling that their local issues have been lost. And we've talked about elite schools. Um, I was wondering how higher education, particularly in social science, in politics and economics, can address this movement that we've been seeing. All right, I'll take the three questions and I will give, please, Professor. Three very good and, and challenging questions again. First, um, the question asked by my colleague, the president of the University of Kuwait, on the quality of education received by our students in, a, in their third year abroad. Um, the network of universities where we send our students is a wide one, but they are all universities with which we engage on a one-to-one on a, on a -one -one basis to draw the exchange agreement to determine which departments our students will be studying in, as we did with Kuwait uh, University. Um, and our students um, have to meet with a number of academic requirements in their year abroad, uh, the number of ECTS uh, they will gain, uh, the types of, of subjects they will follow, uh, and, and uh, exams they will take, that ensure that there is 
a solid academic foundation to their year. But then, of course, the academic experience varies greatly whether you go and study at Northwestern or uh, at one of the colleges of the University of Delhi. We fully appreciate that, as do our students. And part of the experience of the third year abroad is going beyond the strictly academic experience and the gains that you re derive from, from studying uh, in, in a good foreign university. And a lot of that experience has to do with simply discovering what it is to live in an environment very different from the one you're accustomed to, especially when it comes to countries that are far more alien to you than, uh, than a neighboring European country. So the quality of that third year is not strictly limited to what is actually being taught in the classrooms where our students are doing that third year. And we find them systematically incredibly changed by that third year, changed in the better sense of the world, by, by, of the word, by the fact they have been challenged to function in an environment which is different from theirs, irrespective of the quality of the classes they've taken. And I've never seen a student come back disappointed from a third year abroad, whatever the type of institution he or she has uh, studied in uh, may have been. Uh, but this being said, we do monitor closely what they, what they learn in all of the uh, universities we, which we, in which we send them. Um, the gentleman from the Ministry of Higher Education asked a very important question about rankings. As I said, we, place, we put little stock in rankings at Sciences Po because we, know that we, we, we stand no chance of ever being highly ranked in Shanghai as long as we keep focusing strictly on the social sciences. As you know, there's a strong bias in the big uh, rankings uh, in favor of the hard sciences, of, of uh, the, the living sciences, and so on and so forth. And all institutions such as ours have to uh, accept that they play a side role in that, in that sense. This being said, as you were pointing out, France has made an effort in recent years to encourage um, rapprochement, to encourage mergers uh, of universities that had been separated in the early 70s, uh, encouraging them to come together, to bring their, their um, excellent uh, programs together, to create a new type of comprehensive research universities uh, strongly, um, strongly uh, geared to uh, international competition with the hope that is going to help those uh, new institutions rise in the, uh, in the rankings. This being said, I think we're facing, for many of those universities, an issue uh, that has to do with funding, with financing, because typically in France, uh, most of the university system is publicly funded with very, very limited tuition paid by the students. And in the global context, which uh, I was describing before, uh, in which many of the top universities in the world are in fact universities where you do pay tuition, and that, of course, enhances greatly the resources that uh, those universities can, uh, can uh, depend upon, we can probably no longer function in that kind of an economic environment. So there is discussion in France at present on the possibility of raising tuition fees it's a very controversial issue. Of course, it wouldn't go down well with, uh, with students. Um, attempts have been made to move in that direction. I do not see the current government moving um, seriously in that direction, but that is one of the issues which I think uh, make it hard for even the best universities in France to really uh, function at the highest level of, of, of competition internationally, especially because the financing of research is, is at stake uh, where other universities can master a lot more means to, to do so, a lot more resources. And then your question on globalization and uh, the backlash that we all witness with the rise of populism, that is, to me, one of the biggest issues and challenges that we're facing today, which I, I tried to address in, in my speech when I referred to the need for us to be globally connected and at the same time connected locally. And what we aim to do, we, we've worked on this for the past six years, and we, we, we aim to try and find new initiatives that will make this even more concrete. We aim to make it possible for our students to be engaged at a global level, in, you know, through what they learn in the classroom, through the classmates they meet, through their year spent abroad, but also to have very direct interactions with the environment much closer to home, whether it be through the civic engagement course that I described for undergraduates or other types of activities, internships, case studies, group projects aimed at solving one concrete issue for uh, an institution or a firm. All those activities are taking a, a, a bigger and bigger 
part of the, uh, of, of, the, um, of the curriculum because I believe they are essential in rebuilding the bridges between the educated few, the educated elites that have the, the great good fortune of, of studying in those universities and the rest of the, of the world. And the issue of diversity in recruitment of the students, of course, is also essential there because if we do succeed in drawing into our universities students who really do come from all backgrounds, even the the, the, the most impoverished backgrounds uh, and families in, 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 in our country and in the world, then we create uh, the possibility for some of those least favored people to aspire to, uh, to, to joining us. And we are, I think, more faithful to our mission, which is to um, educate all talents uh, to, to, uh, to um, become leaders in the future. I'll take uh, the last uh, <coughs> set of questions. And after that, if you still have a question, you could, I will close the session to allow people to uh, leave if they wish to leave. But if you have diehard questions, <coughs> come to the podium. Maybe we can get a few more minutes. I really want uh, President Mayon to rest a little bit. He <laughs> arrived late last night, and he has a heavy schedule in the morning before he leaves the country. So I have uh, Abdel Majid, then I have the young lady there, the young man there, and then Dr. Abouid Bahamra, uh, the last one I have, at least I have recognized. Okay, please. Uh, thank you, Abdul Majid Shatti. I'm from the private sector, uh, retired uh, person. Uh, the question is, uh, in a country where you have the whole economy dependent on the government, where you have uh, people, you know, uh, uh, people pay, uh, they don't pay the actual cost of the services because they receive subsidies. You don't have taxation system. Uh, you don't have a, a, a pricing mechanism to, 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 to make the change in the society, where you have uh, faculty members, the first day he uh, you know, starts teaching at the university, he gets tenure, where you have the private sector universities are profit-making universities uh, and dependent heavily on the government. If you look at their profits in the past, the trend in their profits is just jumping uh, like a rocket. Uh, how can you make change in such a setting without having somebody championing this change? Thank you. Young lady there, introduce yourself. Okay, um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this fantastic presentation. Uh, my name is Zahra, I'm a master's student in computer science and information technology from Kuwait University. Um, and I work as a research assistant right there. Uh, my question is, what type of opportunities does uh, Sciences Po offer for grad students or even for researchers, as I'm working on my thesis right now, um, like exchange programs, internships, um, things that can empower us to work more. For example, last year I was honored to be part of an exchange program at Harvard University, where I got the chance to learn more about how to do research, how to conduct a lot of uh, different topics. So what kinds of opportunities does Sciences Po offer? Thank you. Uh, yeah, bonsoir. Uh, thank you, Kefas, for this event. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. It has been probably tackled through the lecture and uh, through the questions earlier. Uh, uh, and it's related also to the future of higher education. Um, we are having a revolutionary leap in education and else's. It's a bit chaotic, but this is the future. It's futuristic. Uh, it has been, uh, uh, th th there's, there's uh, a pointing out toward innovation. Uh, we have icons leaving traditional education for their own startups. Uh, on the other hand, people who continue their education, they feel that they're being sucked up into business. Uh, there is more and more competitive academia, and it seems that it's more, uh, as it has been mentioned earlier, related to profit-making, uh, controlled by business. Uh, it's challenging to become a scholar for the sake of education, for educational values. Uh, my question is for those who didn't establish themselves as scholars and researchers, uh, how can they challenge this pressure and uh, not end up in business, not end up in uh, leaving academia because it's more and more competitive and stay focused on their goal? Last question, Dr. Bahamra. 
Thank you, Dr. Adnan. I would like to thank our speaker, President Mio. I don't have a question, but I have a remark on the third element you mentioned in your presentation, which I wanted to emphasize the importance of the social uh, sciences uh, on the, uh, the uh, natural and, and, and basic sciences. With the drastic uh, increase and fast growing in the, in the sciences, the impact of the natural sciences on the societies seem to be uh, so a big, big impact. So um, the the importance of integrating the social sciences with this uh, with this basic or natural sciences is so much important recently, and this is a trend, especially to introduce the the ethical part. So um, we will be really glad to um, start the collaboration with you with. Uh, uh, science Bo to learn, and even with the consortium of the universities of the science uh, of the social sciences, uh, to implement that in our in our programs. Thank you. May I just compliment what you said? Since this would be the last uh, opportunity for me to, and I, I I agree, and I wanted to pose a question to President Mayo, because in my hand is most of what I learned. Until now, it's already here. So for our kids, they don't have to learn what we have learned. And I agree with you. What is here is mostly the hard sciences. So that's the easy part. <laughs> right? So the hard part is what is not here, which is the social sciences, I think. And I cite an example, what's happening in Google and Facebook and all of those big new technologies that are becoming so influential and they are established by either you know, elite university dropouts or graduates from elite universities. They didn't have enough time to study social sciences. And now the world is facing problems. Our elected leadership in the world is facing a problem because of these new phenomena. But we are also benefiting from them. I wanted to pose this as a final question, comment question, and also to say what you s mentioned about the tension in the public education system because of the fees. I was listening to BBC and I was reminded that public universities in America right now, the top ones, charge around $25,000 fees. And the reason they do that, because they receive from the states only about 15% of their budget. That's not what's happening in France, that's not what's happening in China, that's not what's happening in Kuwait, which is 100%. But you could see the trend. If you want to be at the top ranking, you could see where it's heading. The downside of that, as I heard it on the phone, is that the students who go through that path end up having a debt of about a million dollars by the time they graduate. The floor is yours. I'll take this as a comment and not as a question. <laughs> and, and, and I will concur with what you said, as, as I do with uh, what uh, my colleague, the president of uh, Gerst, uh, said. I would be looking forward to to working with you on devising ways to uh, integrate more uh, the hard sciences and, and engineering with, with the social sciences. We feel that is absolutely essential. Um, now, the gentleman who asked the first question uh, asked a, a question which might be related to the situation in Kuwait of, with which I'm not familiar and uh, on which I feel to be totally incompetent. Um, what I would like to maybe say, uh, and I realize that will not be a direct answer to your question, is that one way to challenge the status quo, one very effective way to challenge the, st the status quo is to um, open the borders uh, of our minds by looking at what's happening elsewhere. And I think that the type of work that's being promoted by KFAS goes exactly in that direction. By fostering collaboration between Kuwait and other, other regions in the world, by developing research training programs here in Kuwait, elsewhere on the planet, that help uh, uh, strengthen the relationship between this, this region and the, the rest of the world, I think it is achieving a lot in helping Kuwait map out its future in whatever direction Kuwait chooses to take. And that doesn't mean that won't be difficulties, but it means at least that uh, a, a key uh, element happens right here with the work uh, KFAS is, is producing. Um, I would like to thank the uh, uh, young lady who's studying computer science for her question on how uh, one could possibly uh, come and do work at Sciences Po, uh, one who is in your position. 
I'm afraid we don't have a com computer science department at Sciences Po, as you, um, as you heard, we specialize in the social sciences. This being said, we do sometimes resort to uh, computer science specialists for some of the work we do. Um, and it so happens that I will be meeting with your president first thing tomorrow morning to discuss further collaboration between our institutions. So maybe we will be thinking of you when we try and, and devise ways to, to uh, uh, foster uh, exchange and, and collaboration. But of course, we do have uh, exchange of students at master's level. We do on occasion take students on internships at Sciences Po, although that, that's fairly rare. We take research assistants with uh, capabilities such as yours, so that, that there's a number of opportunities. Um, but obviously the subject you're studying makes them probably a, a little fewer than uh, if, if you were, say, a political science major or a, a law major. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, the gentleman uh, at the top of the auditorium asked a question on how to, um, if I understood correctly, how to um, stick with the aim of becoming a scholar in a world where, where um, economic success seems to be the measure of all things. Uh, I think that's a very good question. I think it takes uh, some amount of courage and also of, um, um, how should I say that in, in English, uh, of uh, abnegation, how do you say that? Uh, Self-restraint, or whatever you want to call it, to, to choose uh, the path of academia, which is very, uh, very uh, competitive um, in the face of other possibilities offered to people uh, with, with degrees in their pockets to, to go and earn their livings elsewhere. Uh, nonetheless, this is uh, a path which is full of gratification of other kinds, as I'm sure um, all of your professors may be able to tell you, and as many of my colleagues at Sciences Po would tell you as well. Um, and this being said, I do not think that we need to think of um, the world of academia as functioning in opposition to the rest of the world. Uh, if anything, I think it's very important for us to be able to think of all the connections that the academic world needs to build with the rest of the world, the world of business, the world of politics, the world of uh, culture, uh, of uh, intellectual life, um, in order to better do its task of training people for, uh, for the future. And I'm sure that... Um, uh, you will be able to find your, your path in, in this. But I realize that maybe I, I'm only partially answering your question. And I think this is it. I thank you very much. I think there are so many things. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who have one or two minutes questions, please come to the podium. But everybody else, thank you very much for being with us and being so interested. And see you again in KFS Link series. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Let me give you my, my cell phone number.